All right, since we're all bragging about our hair, uh, this is from when I first met Louise. And uh, shortly afterwards, I met Lauren and Trish and more of the gang. Uh, but um, in any event, this is um, a long, long time ago. And, uh, but this reminded me in, in listening to people talking and particularly uh, Alvi yesterday talked about how we you know, worked on AI 50 years ago. And, um, you know, Marvin Minsky, of course, was very, very important in the field, developing and popularizing the field. And he came and gave a lecture roughly at this time when my hair was like this at University of Illinois in Chicago. And he uh, told us all about AI. And I remember afterwards uh, uh, talking to Dan Sandin, I said, well, Marvin, you know, just described this universe in which he was going to, you know, create more stupid humans. And it was my opinion that we had enough stupid humans and what in the world do we need more of them for? Um, and of course, I was completely wrong. It took a while, but I was wrong because we don't have enough stupid humans. Uh, and one example is that um, one of our professors here, Jules Jaffe, after we put a 10 gigabit link out the uh, scripts pier and sunk it down to a camera um, that was taking HD images um, underwater in this protected environment and was gathering millions of images. And the whole goal was to see whether something new came along and then to analyze it. And the problem was, is that he did not have enough graduate students to actually look at all these pictures, which is what you used to do is you have graduate students look at all the pictures, but he didn't have enough. And so one of his uh, techs uh, wrote a, a program run on a GPU to just basically see whether using machine learning, whether they were seeing anything new and then save that image for further, further inspection. So to a large part, the need for this field has come from uh, digital photography cost going to zero, effectively. Video is the problem that we get on our phones and everything else and all the sensors out there. And we have such a glut of all of this that something's got to make sense of it. And that really turns to machine learning. And so that's how we got here. It was the absolute explosion of iPads and iPhones and, and whatnot. Um, and the fact that this is a problem that we all um, that we all deal with. So I'm going to describe our solution to this problem from a university point of view, and I call it potluck supercomputing. Uh, for those of you who don't um, know this term, this is something that's used for when you have a communal breakfast or something at a church or a fundraiser, and everybody brings their own um, dish of food. Uh, now, what happens is, is that it all combines and becomes an experience. And usually there's plenty left over. There's plenty for everybody, including somebody who wanders in and doesn't have food to offer because um, they're either poor or they can't, you know, didn't get their act together or whatever. So I'm going to attempt to move on. So Jeff Weekly asked me to address these, these uh, five things here or six things. What motivated Nautilus? What does it offer researchers and infrastructure engineers that you need? Tom, we are not seeing your, we're only seeing your title slide still. We're not oh, advancing. How did that happen stuff. again? You know, I practiced this earlier and let's see if I can figure out what's going on. You, you don't okay. seem to be in slideshow mode. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, uh, maybe that's what's wrong is I have to go out of that. And you know, this happened yesterday too. I didn't figure out why. Um, so it stop. seems like the presentation window is the other window that then. That yeah, then let me try again, see if this works. So what happens when you have a Zoom with so many PhDs is that we can give each other advice on how to run PowerPoint. Okay, now it won't back up. Um, can you see a different slide yet? Uh, we do see, but we are seeing slide number yes. two or three. Okay, now I got to figure out how to make it go backwards because there we go. All right. All right. So what made it motive? Thank you, everyone. What motivated Nautilus? What does it offer researchers and infrastructures, uh, infrastructure engineers that's unique or notable? How do people collaborate? How does an organization contribute? What's required of a user? And what is different from AWS or traditional HPC? And I have 25 minutes or 23 probably by now. So about 10 years ago, the uh, Department of Energy uh, engineers figured out that it was um, data wasn't moving very fast from disk to disk, from institution to institution, 
over distance. And they analyzed the problem and figured out that this is all the fault of TCP IP, the TCP part that doesn't perform well over distance with large amounts of data. So they figured out that the reason why was because the campus that was receiving the data was pushing the data through um, firewalls and causing TCP to go into this back off mode, which uh, destroys its performance. So by putting the receiver outside of the campus network into a thing called the science DMZ or demilitarized zone, um, then they eliminated the problem. The National Science Foundation then made over $150, $500,000 awards, which means $750, I mean $75 million to build um, DMZs all over the country and upgrade uh, um, these universities infrastructure so that they could plug in. But um, NSF at that point did not fund any applications or any technology besides the uh, DMZ itself. Um, and like I said, 150 campuses took advantage of this. So then Larry Smarr, about seven years ago, had this idea that we ought to do something with all of this and uh, build an infrastructure that could prove out the capability of the DMZs. And uh, we got a, a nice grant from NSF, which is still going. And the goal of that was to accelerate data transfer by a thousand times. In other words, from about five um, megabits a second, which is what we're getting campus to campus, disk to disk typically, to um, you know, five uh, gigabits a second. It turns out that we are now verging on 550 uh, gigabits a second or 10,000 times with the newest hardware. So this involved uh, linking in supercomputer centers and all these campuses and using the scenic network as a already built background. So, and then we expanded it to prove that it wasn't something that would only work in California due to the distance that the universities are all kind of 500 miles apart uh, at worst. And uh, so that we expanded this to also to places, um, including Amsterdam was the first and, uh, and Korea uh, internationally, Australia, Guam, uh, Hawaii, New York, uh, et cetera. And it turns out that it, uh, the distance really doesn't matter. It really has to do with the receiving unit being fast enough. So we designed these things. We called our data transfer nodes. It's the Department of Energy term. We called them FIONAs because I like to have pronounceable acronyms. And we wanted to design something that when it was replicated, we knew if it actually met our spec. It's kind of what you do with branding. Uh, some of the first ones we built were these uh, uh, Dion, uh, Fiona's and put them at Santa Cruz and hooked to their 40G and then 100G networks. Um, and these uh, provided each about 200 and something terabytes of storage. And we built many more and put them into um, Ceph pools. And uh, um, uh, Jeff briefly talked about those. And then we figured out that we could build um, eight uh, GPUs, and these are game GPUs, although you can use the um, HPC GPUs in these 2U gigabyte boxes, and that these would be perfect for machine learning, uh, that's very heavy GPU and not so much CPU uh, dependent. So why, why do we build Nautilus? Um, so um, we wanted to add value to the specific research platform and it's a platform. So we want to build something on the platform that would be useful for our researchers uh, beyond the goal of accelerating data transfer. We want to do something with the data. And I realized by talking to faculty members that computer scientists who were doing machine learning could not get enough GPU access. Uh, this had largely to do with their lack of skill in, in getting supercomputer time, which is a skill. Um, and, um, and the fact that they, were, they wanted so much of it, uh, they really are voracious. Um, John Graham's vision, uh, John works for me, is that these uh, boxes that we initially built to, to um, essentially prove that we can move data over networks could be actually um, lashed together to form a GPU cluster. And that this cluster would then be accessible by faculty and students without burning, burdening experts with learning Kubernetes. Um, and try hiring yourself a Kubernetes expert. Um, we tried, and then we had to change the job to the job call to say, we'll teach you Kubernetes, 
because we didn't get a, anybody responding to the first one. We got a bunch for the second time and we said, we'll teach you Kubernetes. So Nautilus uses Kubernetes and this is Google's open source system for automating deployment, scaling and management of containerized applications. It supports down deep tools like Traceroute and uh, Perfsonar, which is the reason we first did it. And then uh, uh, to manage, you know, over 100 machines distributed all over the place. But then it also does high level stuff like JupyterLab, which allows you to build these um, examples that people can invoke without having to know a whole lot, except where their what their data is and what program they want to apply to analyze it and do machine learning on it. And this allows us with, you know, this, I think there's three or four, I have three or four full-time equivalent people for all of this, including all the research. And uh, the, the Kubernetes and Rooksef allow us to manage petabytes of data distributed all over the place and lots of GPUs. You've got 550 of them right now uh, for data science while we measure and monitor the network use. The measuring and monitoring is actually what we get paid for, amazingly enough. And so this is the distribution around California of places and, um, and um, you can see we've got over 500, 550 GPUs, depends on the day, uh, 184 hosts, 7,000 CPU cores, 32 locations and five petabytes of storage. That's a decent sized cloud. One of the benefits of Kubernetes, and this was originally um, put in the proposal uh, by Case Delot um, as a way of creating these uh, cooperating research groups, but it turns out that Kubernetes does this with uh, namespaces, so we didn't have to actually develop anything. And this allows us to isolate the users. Every user gets root access, uh, create an environment for them to collaborate. There can be lots of people in these namespaces that are doing something together. And we can define policies about what they get and, and uh, and where they get it. And, uh, and we learn the policies become uh, adapt. So this uh, Kubernetes uh, namespace thing is really important. It's the basic organizing principle that we use for people. So I want to give you a little supercomputing hierarchy. Um, I've been involved in supercomputing since I met Larry Smarr in 1977, I guess, six. Um, and um, uh, back then there was military or government supercomputing at the national labs and a few other places around the planet. Um, these are expensive, extremely expensive craze and you, uh, they were generally not accessible. Uh, then Larry led the charge to uh, have NSF in this country uh, come up with this concept of meritorious supercomputing where universities, some universities it was started out with five, would get supercomputers and they would have elaborate, and they still do have elaborate ways of allocating time to meritorious users. A meritorious user is somebody who's got plenty of publications and plenty of, um, of uh, reasons to use the, um, the computer as determined by their peers. So they, they decide who should get each other like everything else at NSF. Some campuses wanted to be part of this game. And so they actually funded their own supercomputers. And so there was now campus supercomputing and, super, and supercomputing actually became kind of cheaper. Although there's still a high end, depending on how much you can afford. And then the cloud got invented, which gave us business class supercomputing. So this is supercomputing for companies and it's really designed for companies. And this is, you know, the cloud as we know it, AWS and Azure and Google. But as the title of this uh, lecture uh, indicates that we decided to come up with a potluck supercomputing idea and call it Nautilus. And um, one of our um, colleagues uh, was more formal and he says, well, I don't know if that's gonna fly at NSF. So um, he, uh, this is Frank Worthwine said to, let's call it bring your own resources and devices. But this in my uh, unhinged mind originally came, um, reminded me of Chef Boyardee. And I went and looked for some pictures and I saw that Chef Boyardee had both a unary model with just zeros and an ESCII model with, uh, uh, you know, ABCs and one, two, threes. So continuing the culinary um, 
uh, analogies, uh, if you can't bring your own resources and devices, and so this would be for researchers and students who don't yet have uh, GPUs or their GPU just broke and they're, uh, it's gotten thrown out of, the, uh, out of Nautilus automatically, we refer to a soup kitchen supercomputing, and um, maybe some people don't know what soup, soup kitchens are. That's the, uh, and they're awfully popular right now with the pandemic, but that's where you go to get free food. So here's where you go to get free, um, free supercomputing. So the original implementation of Nautilus was primarily funded by an NSF uh, project we call Chase CI as a community-based distributed academic infrastructure for computer scientists. Um, and uh, NSF support for Nautilus is ongoing. And we have three, it's actually four proposals in review, pushing for a national expansion. And we welcome global partners. So we have partner, active partners in Australia and, um, and Korea uh, for some time now uh, with GPUs that are online. And we manage them with them. Uh, Podluck supercomputing is a model for incremental growth and continuous refreshing. This is actually a really important idea because supercomputers generally are these monoliths that are brought in in a truckload of computers installed um, and commissioned and then used for four or maybe five years and then pitched off the end of a dock. During the meantime, the people who run them have, with luck, um, uh, written another grant to get a new one but they're not built to be um, uh, incremented or continuously refreshed particularly well. But this is the design of Nautilus because we expect people to bring their own pieces and plug them in. And when something stops working, they can fix it or they can throw it out, but uh, Kubernetes gets, and we know that just like your laptop, these things are good for three or four years. So the way it works is a researcher buys a $16,000 to $24,000 Fiona 8, or maybe even a couple dozen of them. Um, and the campus networking engineers uh, install them in their science DMZ. And John and Dima Mishin here then join the Fionas to Nautilus with Kubernetes. The researchers containerize their code, or they've probably done this already and tested it, or use a Jupyter Lab notebooks to run things. Um, and for more details, please contact me or go to pacificresearchplatform.org. And if it isn't clear, tell me because we're trying to make that better all the time. So why is this well suited to machine learning and AI research? Um, well, we built this open cloud. We mentioned this before, and it's really optimized for researchers and students. And the clouds really acknowledge that they're not optimized for researchers and students. It isn't like it's a, it's a competition here. Um, the Nautilus architecture is, is well suited to machine learning because computer scientists and machine learning really want real-time supercomputing. I mean, computer scientists like to be able to change things on the fly, monitor them, fix them, debug them, et cetera. And the Nautilus is a real-time supercomputer. They consume huge amounts of GPU computing. They can't just steal with a box under their desk. They often require access to gigabytes and terabytes of data. Um, and the, the uh, cloud does not make this a simple thing. The cloud makes access to terabytes of data, or petabytes of data, or gigabytes of data even uh, annoying and expensive. Uh, Nautilus rewards and teaches community sharing. Uh, we spend a lot of time trying to get people to work with each other. And uh, this is something that Jeff Weekly is deeply involved with, uh, at, with us at University of California Santa Cruz now. It takes advantage of game GPUs. Um, these are 32-bit machines. They're way cheap. Um, and uh, they're much lower cost than the uh, ruggedized HPC uh, versions, but they, uh, they're pretty good. And when they do fail, we just uh, stop them, you know, it's and, and kind of throw them out. Of course, GPUs, the G and GPU is graphics. And, um, you know, they're designed to throw polygons around, but they work, so they work very well for computer graphics. And, um, and uh, visualization techniques like structure for motion that build three point clouds and other applications. 
But we can also hook in FP64 GPUs, the HPC GPUs that cost 10 times as much, as well as FPGAs and Jetsons and other kinds of um, emerging architecture that is probably going to beat the, um, the GPUs into smithereens or, or uh, make this stuff even more distributed. So how do you play with this? Well, you should try Nautilus. Uh, deploy applications, measure performance if you wish, write proposals. We have to write proposals. And with those proposals, add your own potluck node to Nautilus and support your students or researchers or, or yourself. Um, or if you're really good at writing proposals, you can build your own local cluster or get your campus to build one and explore linking it to Nautilus. And that's called federation. This kind of thing requires uh, your campus CIO and uh, networking people to, um, to cooperate, which I would grant you to tell anyone, they, no matter how much money they have, uh, they've got about a 50% chance, which is still not bad. So if you have CI Logon, which is a um, integrated identity and access management platform that's adopted by most universities, you can immediately join Matrix, uh, read the uh, documentation, try JupyterHub, create your own namespace and deploy a job. And uh, there are ways to do this uh, right there. So how is Nautilus different from AWS or traditional HPC? Well, one of the things which I forgot to talk about yesterday is that the first thing anybody asks is how do I know that if I put a machine in Nautilus that I'll get to use it all I want? In other words, at least as much as you paid for. And we can, and we often do, isolate machines. If somebody's got a few machines on there with you know, eight or 24, 200 GPUs, and they've got a big paper coming up, uh, we, uh, we take them offline and only their namespace can get at it. And then as soon as they're done, uh, we put them back on. And this can actually be done in minutes. Um, we do this with this, uh, um, with the sun cave that many of you have seen that when we're actually, the days we're actually doing something in there now, um, we can um, remove all of the GPUs, the 70 of them. And then we put them back online as soon as we're uh, finished with the demo. I highly recommend you look at this lecture by Matthew Medani and uh, Lauren can put this in the, um, in the chat. It's, um, it really describes, I think, brilliantly why uh, Nautilus is better for what he's doing, which is a TerraVoxel 80 GPU project that he's been able to do um, at the, um, in particular, at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Um, and um, I think you'll enjoy it if you look at it. So what's different about Nautilus and AWS and traditional HPC? Um, well, it's... Um, Nautilus is hosted on premises at universities, which means they provide free power space networking and sysadmin for researchers and students. Uh, traditional university research funding is a CapEx model. In other words, you um, spend money capital and, uh, and you get stuff and then you plug it in. For historical reasons, there is no university overhead. We pay 55% typically tax on research equipment. Uh, we don't pay it on research equipment, we pay it on salaries and everything else, supplies, travel. And this is what pays for the free power space networking. It also pays for the very high speed data sharing and the networking, which combined with our um, uh, Ceph pool makes data sharing free for researchers. And we designed this, you know, it'd be complementary to AWS and things, which, you know, in the long run will probably win anyway. But clouds on AWS uh, are very expensive over the long run for researchers. Um, a GPU is a dollar an hour or $9,000 a year. And that doesn't sound like much, but um, it adds up if you're using 100 GPUs or even eight, you know. Uh, <clears throat> data sharing can be very expensive for researchers. Uh, and, and that's part of the, uh, the model for the clouds. Uh, the clouds are all operational expense. So university researchers pay 55% overhead typically. And you can't figure out the bills. And if you look at the New York Times today, there's a prominent argue, uh, article uh, and it has uh, features, a, um, a 
person who makes his living off of um, telling people how to reduce their Amazon bills by, uh, by understanding them. Uh, it's a serious problem. Uh, we tried to do comparison between AP, AWS and our on-premises, um, and we can no longer do it because we can't figure out our AWS bills. It was three or four years ago we could do it. So how is it compatible? So Nautilus, first of all, is great for training researchers and students, because a lot of what we do is train students. So when they got in the real world that really do have budgets, that will support AWS, that they're good at it. Uh, one woman um, in uh, San, um, uh, <coughs> San Jose State University said, As accessing Nautilus will help me come up with a proper proposal. Faculty do two things in life. They write proposals and they teach students. And the next, uh, another uh, person said, uh, Nautilus lets my students explore without running up the bills. And then we help students and, and researchers be efficient. And we give them a hard time if they're not being efficient, so they learn. And of course, uh, nobody in the commercial sector would be interested in, in doing that. Um, so, Nevertheless, Nautilus is completely compatible with Kubernetes on, uh, on the clouds. So researchers can burst to them if they have the money. And um, some of the new supercomputers uh, that NSF is funding are also compatible, allowing researchers to propose access to competitive meritorious cycles. So I'm going to end up with this slide. This is a new supercomputer uh, that has just been stood up at San Diego Supercomputer Center, and it's a medium-sized one. And, um, and it's based on a lot of the ideas that Nautilus proved. And in fact, it's being federated with Nautilus, which means we can move jobs back and forth between it in ways that, that are uh, uh, obey their allocation schemes, uh, but uh, also work with our, um, our equipment. And um, <clears throat> Lauren wanted me to describe today a little bit about composable systems. And uh, composable systems are basically a term for sort of software defined infrastructure or, or IT. And it allows you to specify how many GPUs and memory and CPUs and data where it is, et cetera. And the uh, system goes and finds these pieces for you. And since it's all containerized, it spits the containers out and runs. And so that's what that idea is. It sounds simple, but of course it involves huge layers of software that has to work and continue to work through many, many, many revisions. And with that, um, I'm suggesting for future Synegrades, now we heard, heard an awful lot of good ideas earlier on from this group, uh, but from the point of view of Nautilus for future Synegrades, we could go much more into any of these uh, uh, deeper topics um, or split off into a side group. And um, I would be happy to explain these. Uh, and I think uh, I've already volunteered John Graham to give a, a deeper lecture sometime in the future. Um, and we have many applications in science and media I think would be worthwhile in talking about. So if I haven't gone over time, if I have, I apologize. If I haven't, I need to just acknowledge all the people who have supported us. Uh, most of our support does come from National Science Foundation, our partner campuses, and the networks. So thank you very much.